All right, and we are live. Good afternoon, everybody. You are tuned into the Spotlight Series. I am Zach Ritter. I'm Associate Dean of Students at Cal State Dominguez Hills, which is in Compton, Carson, California. And I have the pleasure of being here. Thank you, Joe Brooks, the director of CWI, Community Works Institute, communityworksinstitute.org. Check them out. They bring the community to the classroom and the classroom to the community. A, and they have professional development opportunities that you will enjoy. Um, I do some workshops for them. Some other cool people do some workshops for them. Uh, I don't know. Am I cool? Maybe I'll let you decide. Uh, and yes, um, they offer. Uh, they also offer uh, equity, justice, and diversity um, workshops, and also professional development opportunities for K through twenty. Not only K through twelve, but K through twenty um, educators. And we have a K through 20 educator with us here today. His name is Jonathan Chan, one of my good friends and one of my great colleagues. I don't know if you, maybe you're a better colleague than you are a friend. No, I, we won't go there, um, but you're amazing. Uh, we worked at Harvey Mudd College together in the Diversity Center and you are at Pitzer College now. Uh, you went to uh, Riverside, UC Riverside for undergrad and Fullerton, Cal State Fullerton for grad. Uh, tell the folks who you are and what you're about. Hey everyone, uh, Jonathan Chan, pronouns he, him, his. Uh, what am I about? Um, well, like Zach was talking about uh, an educator first and foremost, for sure uh community advocate um at pitzer college i'm the program coordinator uh for community engagement and uh just doing a lot of liaison work that happens between the local community and the campus community to build partnerships uh institutional initiatives uh that serve in the capacity of college access pipelines um you know different issues that you know affect the community such as homelessness uh food insecurity uh, all these different kinds of things. And uh, that's what I do professionally, but obviously that is informed and been informed by the life that I've lived, uh, both as a creative artist, as well as someone that's like deeply involved uh, on a ground level with just a lot of uh, beautiful projects that have taught me so much about, you know, education and just life. So, wow. Okay. I'll be okay. here. Well, it's a pleasure to have you. I'm getting a lot of pings from the audience saying, uh, how did you get so beautiful today? Uh, well, I have a good moisturizing process. Uh, I specifically <laughs> use shea butter. Uh, yeah, no. you have to. Yeah, it's, a, yeah. it's all the cool kids are, are doing it these days. So, um, so you're, you're an artist and you're an educator. Tell us about some of the art that you do. You, you, you dance, you do break dancing. Um, you did a phenomenal workshop at Harvey Mudd College where you were talking about the history of hip hop, but also break dancing in like 1970s, 80s, New York City. Tell the folks a little bit about uh, your art background. Yeah, so I've been a b-boy break dancer for 15 years and I started in high school. Um, I was into sports. I just sought a way to, you know, express myself in a way that I wasn't being fed you know, and it was just an amazing experience in which uh, it catapulted me into this world of competitive breaking, traveling from state to state, uh, even locally competing, uh, getting invites to certain competitions, judging, giving workshops, teaching at dance studios, uh, and overall uh, also leading me to like community advocacy work for creative arts and making them accessible. Mm -hmm. uh, that's also been, you know, uh, something that I love just because like when you're in it you're young all you want to do is compete like anything else you want to shine you want to show off for you know your friends you know you want to be somebody yeah. and that's what I hope to have you know when I got into all of this and having that uh, understanding of what uh, art and dance has done for me developmentally mm -hmm. uh, just on a personal level personality level uh, definitely helped shape who I am and it's gotten me in contact with just so many different kinds of people that I wouldn't have thought otherwise. And uh, overall, really a culminating experience was just being able to go to UCR, uh, create like dance curriculum for the local kids there, as well as uh, 
do performances, free dance events that connected to the local Inland Empire community. Uh, and yeah, but it's not all sunshine and rainbows. Like you learn hard stuff too. Like you learn like uh, obviously like racial dynamics, uh, you know, appropriation versus appreciation, uh, all those different kinds of things and spaces that, uh, you know, are, you know, originally from Latinx and uh, black communities as it is birthed uh, through the culture of hip hop. So, I mean, in those ways, it's also very beautiful too. Uh, those hard lessons, but also uh, really real experiences that you gather from other folks. And uh, overall, it's just gotten me into, you know, this kind of work. It was the gateway. Mm. And uh, it was also what helped me get through uh, college. Wow. Dang. Well, as an Asian American guy, how do you navigate some of those spaces? Ah, I mean, like, it's funny, right? Like you at some points tiptoe and then at some points you have to have a bravado too, right? Uh, it's a balance. Um, you need to know how to hold space, but also uh, give space. And sometimes not even be in the space. Um, and that's uh, something that just comes with time. Uh, when it comes uh, to the culture of hip hop, uh, it's extremely important to uh, you know, have this balance of paying homage to where it's been, understanding how you're rooted in it, um, as well as where can it be brought forward. And so being a part of uh, something that's uh, you know, rooted in a lot of like, uh, you know, need for freedom, uh, liberation, uh, folks that created in the 1970s to have a voice, to be somebody that uh, wasn't defined by the narratives that were placed on their bodies by, you know, sociopolitical context, right? Uh, to, to have that is, is something that, you know, has obviously touched the globe and it, it's touched my life and it's touched my heart. Uh, and just being able to, um, you know, be an advocate for where it matters and also uh, just, be a participant in in many ways uh teaching the art form to other folks uh you know breaking has changed my life hmm. beautiful all right wow damn uh starting off with the big big stuff um big stuff big stuff big stuff coming through watch out uh <laughs> what tell us about young jonathan i don't think we ever talked about this like what was it like growing up what you did and, and what was school like and what were your parents like yeah uh that's funny i know i just mentioned like how breaking uh has had a big part of my life and uh, i guess i'll go to that for the sake of like continuity is um needing to like find a voice was like really big for me growing up just because i grew up in diamond bar california um roland heights area too uh but i've been around all of so SoCal because my family's like all around SoCal, but uh, growing up in Diamond Bar, California, you know, pretty big immigrant community, uh, mostly Asian, but there are, there is a strong uh, Nigerian population, Latinx population, um, and it's a beautiful place to grow up, kind of slow, but it's, in, it's situated in a very interesting area where like nobody really knows where it's at because it like borders Orange County. It's technically LA County and it borders San Bernardino County. Mm. So when you mention Diamond Bar, you're like, oh yeah, I stopped by there for gas, right? Mm. And, uh, yeah, not to gas the place up. <laughs> but um, anyways, yeah, growing up there, kind of quiet. You, you want to seek ways to be different. You know, you want to seek ways to be you. And uh, that's what I wanted and that's what I needed. Um, even though the place was extremely Asian, like I didn't have necessarily the same experiences as other kids. Like it's like fairly affluent and, you know, I didn't have all the same resources um, as some of those students. And, uh, you know, I, I, <laughs> I chose to really hone in on, uh, on art and uh, on ways to engage with community through art because, uh, you know, I, wasn't as keen on academics, you know, my family didn't have all the money to like do after school every day that made all the other kids competitive for like high range, you know, I mean, institutions for college and stuff, you know, like we didn't have all the same access to resources. So a part of me was just like a rebel and being like, uh, I don't need that, you know, mm. and my parents of that same vein, like, even if we couldn't afford tutoring, you know, like they were the ones that stayed up with us like late at night. Um, teaching us math, all that stuff. And I mean, we had some tutors here and there, but for the most part, it was like 
it was like them, you know, like staying up late at night doing homework with us, like yelling at us when we didn't get it right, just trying to figure out like this should be easy, right? But um, yeah, but essentially, I mean, I love my parents for that, you know, uh, I'm Singaporean Chinese, uh, American, damn, that's long, that's three. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, so they, they came from Singapore, uh, they met here in America at uh, the University of Texas, Austin. Mm. Um, and then they got married and then they, you know, had a family and they decided to stay in California. And obviously Don Bar is where they stayed at. Um, but yeah, I, I've grown up in this way of uh, being in a community, feeling halfway in, halfway out, just because I didn't identify in terms of class all the time. But also there's not that many Singaporean folks in the mm. area and it's a tiny island nation that's smaller than LA County. Mm. Uh, Zach should know, right? Picking at the shirt. We'll get into that another time. See, uh, but uh, yeah, and uh, not really having that same kind of community or feeling like I was able to connect with other Asian folks the same way um, was difficult. But like I said before, um, I definitely had culminating experiences through art, uh, through connecting with community in a deeper way that uh, really helped inform my uh, childhood hmm. and uh did your yeah. parents have a tough time I mean we talked talk a little bit about this sometimes like uh my dad being an immigrant and sometimes having trouble integrating into American society did your parents have a tough time integrating or or assimilating or not assimilating yeah I think language wise they didn't because Singapore is like a main, mainly like uh, an English speaking country, uh, obviously like it's beautifully diverse when it comes to linguistics, but uh, it's mainly English. So they didn't have that same kind of struggle in terms of like language, but I mean, there is a lot of like cultural dissonance when it comes to things that uh, obviously still took adapting to, even though they went to college mm. in the States. Um, and that's something that like we always deal with within our family when it comes to like politics, when it comes to like social stuff. Um, and that's not always the easiest to talk about or bridge that gap just because I'm living somewhere halfway in between all of that. And my siblings are elsewhere as well. Yeah. Um, like me, you, I used to have dual citizenship, um, yeah. Singaporean and uh, American. And uh, at some point, I had to give up my Singaporean citizenship uh, because I didn't want to do um, the national service, which is like a rite of passage over there. They don't let anybody get away with it. <laughs> um, so you either have to choose one or the other. And if you don't, uh, you know, you get in trouble or you can't go back. And that's that's what happened for me. I was like barred from the country for like seven, seven and a half years. Wow. So I wasn't able to go back. I, I missed passing of my grandfather. You know, at one point before that time, I was barred. Uh, what's it called? They held me in the airport for a while, making sure like I had all my papers and processes like squared away wow. uh, before I came into the country. And that was the last time before that seven year period that I went back. But um, at, since that time, which is like around after undergrad, like I've been able to go back. But it's like always been this weird thing where it's like, talking about halfway in between where um, not feeling like in many ways, and we can get into this later because like this gets into the whole dynamics of like being API and whatnot. Um, like not feeling fully American, but not feeling fully Singaporean, mm -hmm. being barred from the country in which you don't have to know anybody, but you mm -hmm. still feel like you belong. And mm -hmm. what a beautiful like feeling that is, but to not have that. Um, and then, you know, grappling with like did i make the right choice did i not um yeah it's uh yeah it's difficult but um uh, navigating that with my parents is difficult too because like in some ways like uh they see me as fully american but you know uh in many ways like i still have those singaporean chinese sensibilities that i grew up with and uh you know it's it's hard to navigate that sometimes because like I said, it feels like halfway in between worlds, you know. Do they ever re express regret or something that they, did they want to move to Singapore and take you with? Yeah, that's, that's actually why they kept my citizenship 
office because they weren't exactly sure whether they want to go back or stay here. Um, you know, because Singapore is like a pretty small country. Uh, not that many people get it unless if you like grew up there or you've been part of the culture. Like I said, the community here is very small that's from Singapore, even Malaysia, uh, that's connected to Singapore in like various kinds of ways. We won't get into that, but um, <laughs> yeah, like, you know, I, I don't even know if regret is the word, but longing. Mm. I think that there is this longing, uh, especially as we're feeling right now uh, in the pandemic uh, for this sense of belonging that sometimes we don't always feel in America because we're caught between, you know, these social norms that are placed upon us of like being the perpetual foreigner and also, you know, being a model minority, how it's weird to be juxtaposed against uh, other other people of color, but sometimes not even considered being a person of color and having your narrative decided for you without ever saying if, saying anything about that for yourself because you don't always have like mainstream media platform. And that's mm -hmm. also at play, obviously, like this longing and like obviously wanting to be a part of something, but never being fully represented or asked for your opinion or given voice. And, you know, that's what we're dealing with right now. But it's also a good place to be, you know, in the sense of like, these things are finally a reason why we're talking about them, you know, a lot with uh, AAPI hate and whatnot, so. Yeah, have you, I guess, have you felt uh, a little bit more um, not as safe in the last couple of years because of the rhetoric from the president and, or the former president and other media outlets? Yeah, I, you know, I definitely, but you know, what's interesting is like, I mean, that's always been a thing, uh, but it, it's especially like nuanced with other Asian folks that grow up in different areas. Uh, I've personally like been in the know of that stuff happening, whereas like other Asian folks who don't like move away from, uh, don't move away from their area or like stay in their ethnic enclave, like they don't really get experience to that. But like when I moved, to Riverside, uh, there was a cultural shock, you know, in some ways. It's only 30 minutes away from Diamond Bar, like Roland Heights area, which is extremely Asian. So growing up K through 12, you know what I mean? You have a bunch of diverse friends who like participate in like, you know, your um, your celebrations culturally, they, they're in the know, they eat similar foods to you. Um, and then all of a sudden you're in this new community that is less aware of those things, less aware of like, the diversity that exists out in the world not to say that riverside doesn't have its own kind of diversity but like when it comes to asian culture it's less knowledgeable mm -hmm. and what they are knowledgeable about sometimes is a bit archaic right mm -hmm. and so that's what was difficult like uh being asian there uh in riverside for four years um you know there were certain places that you learned that you weren't supposed to go to because um, you know, you would get jumped, you know, uh, you would get held up at gunpoint. Uh, this specifically happened at a gas station most often next to the extension center where there was the most international students. And the mm -hmm. international students would just tell you, don't go to that gas station because they would drive there, they would get stick ups, things like that. And so, like, I learned that, you know, like pretty early into, you know, I mean, my, my college time there and just like knowing that the undercurrent of like tension with mm. those, you know, those thought processes of model minority myth, perpetual foreigner, they're not really from here, they got money, mm. uh, you know, things like that. And so, I mean, another example of that is like when I lived in Riverside, there was this guy that came and knocked on my door. He was asking for money. He said that he was with this traveling thing that was helping people and you know like some they have those laminated things sometimes mm -hmm. and not all of them but some of them are scams where they're just trying to like scope your house as right. to whether they can rob you right and stuff like that and so like i told him i didn't have any money which is like you know as i mentioned before uh it, it was difficult like getting through through college for various reasons but um i didn't have any money to give him you know because i was paying all my own bills through my dining hall job um and, you know, he got belligerent. He was like, you should have money. You're Asian. Like, I don't understand. And I was like, dude, I don't, I don't know what you want me to say. Like, I don't got any money for you. Right. And I just started to close my door and he just started to like, try and kick my door down. And he just started to like, 
yelling ni hao ma and he was with someone too who i assume was his partner but mm. yeah just started yelling ni hao ma all this stuff and mm. yeah it was it was shocking and then the aftermath of that it was that my apartment complex which i have not told my parents at the time because uh, i'm pretty sure they would have wanted me to move um mm. it was uh what's it called it was uh, burglarized two times mm. in the next six months after that mm. right just to kind of get back at us and you know but that was like a scam but anyways like that links to yeah. like all these kinds of narratives about you know api folks and in the, in that moment like i i learned a lot of in those moments i learned a lot about those things but it wasn't like it was all bad like i i learned a lot about like the folks that did want to build coalition did want to learn more mm. you know about our experience but also their experience and a lot of that happened through the creative arts you know i got connected through a lot of people through uh, dance means hosting uh, local dance events connecting to the youth um on a real community based level where it's like you know we shared and participated in like breaking bread like through like you know building events and business practices with one another so like essentially like you know we were helping to feed each other's futures in in many ways so i mean it wasn't all bad you know wow um so tell us about like elementary or like k through 12 what was that experience like uh did you have some teachers that were inspirational to you uh, um, did you fit in did you not fit in yeah k through 12 um i i mean i felt like i fit in uh it's feel typically the right word like looking physically like right i i felt like i fit in in that way um but like not necessarily culturally uh yeah. just because like like i said before singapore is a super small country i don't know how to speak mandarin uh just because my my parents were uh you know really good at english and they they could get a my mom can speak four different dialects of chinese but my dad can't really speak anything and then when they tried to send us to chinese school um it didn't work out because all my siblings and i the only thing that we cared about was like getting good marks so we could get red vines licorice <laughs> um so you know like the whole we didn't see the reward in the language learning which you know is at our own deficit now <laughs> um and i'm trying to work around like learning again but uh, overall like yeah it was like both this uh physical congruency with folks but this uh sometimes culturally and linguistic incongruency with people uh that didn't always allow things to translate and like i would mention before like even on a class level but i loved my most of my k through 12 experience um besides like you know obviously teenage angst i i think that um what was hard uh about you know high school is that when you have this social pressure uh connecting to both class uh cultural means um you don't necessarily see yourself outside of avenues um that aren't prescribed to the people that you grow up with, grow up with or like the general demographic of like what people think that you should be like doctors lawyers uh other you know people like that within you know the API community even like immigrant communities within that area that moved here to like you know make a living and like be successful their parents sacrificed a lot just like my parents mm. um and like that wasn't always easy because i didn't always see myself in those things i didn't see myself in those ways um because back then like you know neuro neurodiversity um different mm. learning styles that was not a thing mm. right that's not a thing like it is now right we're not we're not championing different ways for our young folks uh to get into um different kinds of professions that may not need a bachelor's degree mm -hmm. maybe they want to be trades people we need that we have a shortage of that right now mm -hmm. they help mm -hmm. america to run mm -hmm. you know and or like maybe they want to go a different avenue than is typical right mm -hmm. but uh yeah i think that that was hard for me because like my parents knew that i didn't really want to go the atypical route of like what a lot of asian parents in the area push for which is like doctors you know pharmacists lawyers uh and i i think that that was a hard thing because like we didn't really know like 
that kind of territory because like in Singapore, it's a bit different where like standardized testing funnels you to certain, uh, uh-huh. you know, profession, you know, yeah, you yeah, live yeah. there. Yeah. Uh, and here it's not like that. Right. Um, here, like there isn't that expectancy. So there is this sense of freedom with knowing what you can be, but also this fear of not knowing what specifically uh, you want to go into knowing the scope of how big this country is, everything that, you know, happens in it. Uh, and, and that, and that was a difficulty of mine. Um, and with my parents is cause like, I didn't want to do that. And that's why I found, you know, a lot of myself in like connecting with community and connecting with, uh, you know, the arts, because uh, that's something that, you know, gave me thoughts about like being a journalist, um, you know, going into, I don't know, some kind of adventure videography, uh, Mm -hmm. being a cook, um, things that, you know, my parents didn't necessarily move here for me to be, you know? Um, And yeah, Yeah. Uh, that was, that was its own challenge. Uh, But, you know, I figured it out. Uh, Right now, um, my parents still don't necessarily have the fullest idea of what I do. Uh, and you know, that's, that's okay because there is like still this cultural dissonance, but you know, whenever I try to explain things to them, um, the easiest way to do it is within the framework of some of my work with, uh, K through 12 college access pipeline systems, Mm. uh, helping to support, uh, young folks, uh, not only understand, um, the kinds of skills that they may need to navigate college or other means of professional preparation, but also just, you know, what does it take uh, internally uh, with like your own strengths, with uh, your own passions uh, to do that kind of work? And like, mm-hmm. I've, I've had the pleasure of working uh, with the Ontario Montclair School District program of Promise Scholars, uh, the Pomona Unified School District, uh, just on various different kinds of uh, mm-hmm. projects such as uh, music, um, enrichment curriculum, uh, also different kinds of college tours that focus on like all the different kinds of avenues that students get get into when it comes to clubs and how that siphons into different professions such as marketing, PR, you know, and creative yeah. arts, uh, even nonprofit work, which is sometimes like a light bulb for kids who mm. want to work in, you know, in ways to com- impact their community and have this feedback loop, which supports their own community and they can mm. see themselves in it and grow mm. and birth it. And, you know, and, that, and that's been a, a big crux of my work um right now so tell us yeah okay we're so we're here so tell us about um we are we are here we are here we're we're Mm -hmm. definitely here Mm -hmm. we're super Mm -hmm. here (laughs) uh pitzer you're doing um community engagement work at pitzer tell Mm -hmm. us about that yeah community engagement work at pitzer right uh so for those that don't know about the claremont colleges um They've been a long-standing consortium within the Southern California community and even like worldly academics for quite a while. First Pomona in the 1800s. And so each of the schools uh, set up one, are set up really close to one another, um, but not without the strategy of each of them emphasizing something different, right? Scripps College emphasizes uh, you know, um, those uh, kinds of studies, as well as an emphasis on college access for those who are women or women identifying. Um, you know, when it comes to Harvey Mudd, it's mostly about STEM. Uh, but at Pitzer College, um, it's always been a focus uh, to think about the implications of knowledge uh, and social justice upon uh, a person's life and the communities that they are a part of personally and professionally. And so that community engagement work has always been, excuse me, integrated into Pitzer College's uh, curriculum and co-curriculum. Mm. And uh, it's, it's really cool to be able to work there because uh, we do all different kinds of things and have had partnerships for the past like 20 plus years that uh, have been built by students who um, see a heart uh, of theirs uh, wanting to be back in their community doing work Um, and like that accounts for places like uh, the Pomona Economic Opportunity Center, 
Mm. Some of the teachers that we connect to that are creating college access pipelines, uh, a lot of those people are alumni of mm. Pitzer College. Mm. We saw that value of education in Pitzer College, but also seeing the way that American higher education trajectory usually goes, um, mm. it also allows uh, a lot of those same folks to examine Pitzer College after having participated in community mm. engagement work, uh, think about like ways that they could make the college better. And so when you go out into community, uh, it's obviously important to think about, you know, not necessarily how we're helping folks in a charity mindset, but how there is reciprocity, how uh, there's sustainable partnership when you uh, do work for tutoring and mentoring for college access, uh, when you do um, citizenship workshops uh, with folks who are possibly undocumented, uh, when you do all these different kinds of things through community engagement channels that we offer at Pitzer, it in turn informs the way that you occupy um, the campus and ways that it can improve. And uh, that's uh, been a very interesting dynamic at Pitzer, uh, which boasts uh, you know, a collective governance uh, thought process about how it works with one another. So hmm. there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of moments of call outs, but there's a lot of moments of call ins. Hmm. Luckily for us, the campus is beautiful inside and out. So whether you call get called in or called out uh, it's a beautiful place to be regardless um but yeah i i think that you know there's a lot of uh amazing stuff that happens there like me personally i've been able to uh help support um the city of pomona with a stop aapi hate rally um yeah. that i helped to coordinate with uh, some of the officials of pomona over there as well as sit on the pomona COVID 19 action committee Oh. Um, you know, do a variety of other works uh, when it came to like um, the past presidential campaign, things like that. So like what we do is like on a very multifaceted level that is not only thinking about like what can Pitzer College get out of these community partnerships, but how are we tr in true partnership by practicing equity, uh, practicing uh, asset-based thought processes when working with one another, seeing these folks as people that can uh, contribute to what we bring um, to yeah. ours. Damn, I didn't know you were doing all that stuff. Uh, tell us about like the inside out classrooms and working in, uh, what is it called? Juvenile detention centers and things like this? Yeah. Yeah, so my um, specific office, uh, we help support um, inside out programs uh, that work in various uh, detention centers, uh, both for adults and for youth. Uh, and even within that nuance or within those nuanced ways, sometimes for mothers mm -hmm. uh, and for folks that are getting uh, drug rehabilitation support. Um, and it's, it's really amazing work, like uh, being able to be a liaison for a lot of these community partners to faculty and students that wanna do a variety of things uh, that have to do with um, like mental health awareness workshops, uh, research to support uh, overall learning for uh, folks that want to go into different kinds of uh, creative arts avenues, different kinds of professions um, mm -hmm. that don't have that access all the time in college, unless if there's an inside out program. Uh, so those are some of the most like loose things that we do um, when it comes to additional things, but like the more inside out program, like specifically, we also help uh, to support faculty getting connected uh, with various groups of uh, folks on the inside uh, that want to take these classes that not only speak to like um, requirements for uh, getting a bachelor's degree, but also like uh, really nuanced um, and, and contextual ways of learning history uh, of learning about politics, uh, organizational culture. It, it's actually pretty interesting. We had this inside our course that was actually called, called the carceral state. Mm -hmm. uh, and that course specifically, uh, you know, is, is one with which, you know, has the underpinnings of, you know, the prison industrial complex, how to explore it, how to talk about it amongst students on the outside, which are our Pitzer students and then students on the inside. And that to understand like how we are involved with one another on a very like minute level by like, you know, the products that we buy every day that are possibly made by prison labor, 
um, mm -hmm. to, you know, how we vote on things like mm -hmm. micro and macro. And like a lot of those students come to that larger understanding about like how every day you can have, you know, uh, you can act part, uh, you can act as a participant in uh, supporting, uh, you know, the prison industrial complex, or you can actively engage against it. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, it's not that easy, you know, to like be fully uh, not invested in the things that uh, we are literally uh, engrossed in in this world, right. but uh, right. it does give you kind of like this understanding of social underpinnings for the systems of oppression that you know we live in and are connected to. Right, because just by banking at certain popular banks, aren't you contributing to these detention centers? Exactly, and so a lot of folks don't know that, or you know they don't know enough to care. Mm -hmm. um and you know that also gets into the politics of like where the institution you know may put its money if the students are interested you know uh may also get into you know where their own families were able to afford such a high-end liberal arts mm -hmm. college uh, experience and mm -hmm. so it's, it's been a really cool uh experience to be able to help support those classes because i know that pitzer college uh really helps uh, to push that uh, initiative forward um, so much so that uh, these inside out courses are uh, connected to a graduation requirement for Pitzer College students known as social responsibility praxis. Uh, praxis being, you know, the uh, ultimate thought process of hands on education and the application of your knowledge of social justice uh, that was pushed forward by Paulo Freire, mm -hmm. um, you know, pedagogy of the oppressed, um, thinking about uh, like real world implications of your knowledge and how you can share that to shape the world. Mm. And so that is one such thing that has uh, influenced the curriculum at Pitzer College and it's a graduation requirement. And it's something that's tacked onto those inside out courses that make them a graduation requirement for students uh, to participate in um, so that, you know, you have a component in which you're connecting with community mm. on various different kinds of levels. And a lot of our students love those courses. They're the, co they're the courses that are, most, that are the most popular because, you know, they get real hands-on experience in terms of skills and whatnot. And then they also learn the kinds of skills and stuff that they thought were valuable that are actually either really harmful or trash. Mm -hmm. so, you, so there's a lot of really cool things that happen in those spaces, like a lot of uh, light bulbs, um, mm -hmm. sometimes hard conversations for folks to have between faculty, students, us and students. Um, as with any kind of community engagement experience where you're walking into, because uh, we live, you know, we, as I like to say, we see the world as we are, we don't see the world as it is. And the way that, you know, the world mm. as us operating in it is different mm. from how other people mm -hmm. are able to operate it, in it as well. And so um, when mm. we're invited into spaces, when we're welcomed in a way to work with one another uh, in anti-oppressive means, uh, not to uphold these kinds of systems, but to work against them, I think that uh, that kind of speaks to, you know, the methodology that Pitzer College has for these inside out courses and other community mm. engagement courses. Mm. Um, Did what you study in Riverside and at Cal State Fullerton, what did you study there and did that prepare you for this? Uh, I, can I go back to K through 12? Sure. Yeah, I think a lot of it started K through 12. Like I was an English major at UCR. Um, and the reason why I did that was because I knew that I wanted to have some se sense of self-expression. Mm. Uh, and I actually used to kind of, I, I, I wrote blogs for folks mm. uh, on hip hop and whatnot um, mm. and, and, and events that had to do with the breaking community. Okay. Um, not in high school, but in college, but that was informed by you know my teachers that invested in me in, uh, in high school uh, through creative writing, uh, through journalistic kind of, you know, writing as well. Um, and they encouraged me to like learn more about hip hop and write about it and see the origins of it. And you know what I mean? It, it was it was amazing because like, if there were classes that I fell in love with, it was those classes um, that gave me, you know, a way to um, even further explore the voice of dance through actual like uh, words, right? Rather than poetry in motion, you know, poetry by the pen. Um, and so I think that siphoned me into getting my English degree, 
seeing the intersections between my English classes and how in many ways the written word of various mediums such as poetry, um, articles by journalists, um, books, novels, uh, are in many ways the psychology of, you know, the human experience throughout, you know, the ages. Um, and, and that's really cool to me because like you get to really uh, read things that are of the vernacular, of the perspective of people at those times. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those classes that I took weren't just English classes, but they also doubled as um, Asian American studies, African American studies, or Asian American writing, African American writing uh, courses. And, and those, you know, those things are what propelled me even further from like learning about um, you know, hip hop, learning about uh, my culture, hmm. um, the diversity of like the K through 12 system that I, that I came from, and then into uh, even a deeper knowledge of, you know, these ways that were implicated in, you know, systems and participate in them on a daily basis when you get into these ethnic studies classes. But ultimately, that led me to um, my master's program, which is like a social justice uh, focused one. Uh, within higher education to think about not only how can we um, make the campus a better place for our students uh, as, you know, co-curricular educators, curricular educators at some points, but um, thinking about how we can leverage institutional resources to support them. Mm. Uh, and, that, and that's always been a big thing because like, if you really do claim to be a state school, if you really do claim uh, to support uh, these communities that you're situated in by receiving all these grants and stuff like that like you should be part of the community mm. right there should mm. be a feedback loop of how that happens to not only invite people into your campus to become students but to retain them and mm. therefore have mentors and other folks that will be thereby invested in bringing people back and that was extremely big for me too you know because having all that you know underpinning of like learning the skills of like assessments of um you know building student learning outcomes, like that was all within the knowledge of like how this connects to equity, how you, uh, how this connects to um, sustainable partnership building with the community, um, all those different kinds of things that we built skills wise, all had that knowledge, that nuanced contextual knowledge that was needed uh, to execute those things properly. And uh, that, that's all started from like the K through 12, um, my undergrad and uh, especially in undergrad, uh, just because like I said, for me personally, college uh, access was just such a great thing uh, mm. that I had um, mm. that other people invested in. What are some of the things, so K through 20 educators might be listening. What's something that you would tell them um, that are challenges with the work that you're doing right now? Because I know there's a lot of taboo around working in detention centers and, and some folks not seeing the value in that, which is kind of mind-boggling to me but yeah um but also you and I working in in Definitely. racial racial justice you know economic and gender justice issues and some folks kind of giving lip service to that but then um at the end of the day it was kind of just money in the bottom line at, at some of these institutions uh what what advice or, or what trends or challenges are you seeing that that you want to tell the field you know, maybe it should move in this direction. That's a heavy topic, right? Hmm. Because I think when it comes to inside out education, when it comes to like helping folks on the inside or not even just helping, but like being a part of, you know, this need to think about the prison industrial complex and how it affects people on a daily basis. Um, both inside and out in terms of like families that are connected to those people and, and then the money tied to the actual facilities themselves. Um, a lot of people want to distance, want to distance themselves away from it because um, they, they feel it's like too politicized. Mm. But I think that one of the trends that we're seeing right now is that there is this awakening of sorts i don't know if that's the right word but you let me know yeah awakening of sorts that you know if we are not funneling our money into public services recreation our schools uh all these different kinds of things they're going into for-profit prisons they're going into um 
you know, these really damaging practices of policing in communities that, you know, create this uh, negative feedback loop of like who comes in and out of prisons. And th there is this definite awakening amongst uh, our educators that we work through our K through 12 systems that know that this is happening more now than ever because of the accessibility of knowledge that we have through the internet. And just like, not only the statistics finally, but also the qualitative information hand, hand uh, lived accounts of these folks, right? And so to know that that is something uh, is to also know how important uh, inside out education is too, because it's not only a matter of getting people, you know, degrees or getting people uh, course credit. Right. It's a matter of like giving rise to their voice. It's a matter of, you know, giving them a way to speak to other folks that wouldn't be had otherwise, right? Mm -hmm. Through the traditional means of like other prison education uh, mm -hmm. programs that are less like asset-based focused, that are less uh, focused on the lived experience of like uh, people on the inside and the communities that they come from that like, are, are caught up in this, these systems of oppression. And so I think, you know, that is one, that's probably the biggest trend, you know, this, this awakening, this uh, acceptance of knowledge, uh, but also um, this choice that you have to either be uh, willfully ignorant to it mm -hmm. or to actually be a part in uh, dismantling it. And so mm -hmm. that, that's, that's huge. Mm -hmm what uh where do you want to go with all this because you've i mean you've done a lot of interesting stuff you've you've been involved with the arts you've been involved with uh community engagement you've been involved with mm -hmm. racial justice issues i mean what's the next step for jonathan chan i don't know um where i started is very different from where i thought i'd be Hmm. And I, you know, I, I'm just so appreciative of the people that I've come into contact with on a professional level as colleagues, but also the people that invested in me um, in college when I was an undergrad. Uh, you know, like I said before, I didn't really know where I was going when I was an undergrad or even like in high school. Hmm. Um, but I did know what was coming at me. Uh, you know, like when I uh, went through college uh, i had uh what's it called i was living at my aunt's place um and it was the situation in which like i wasn't able to afford to dorm uh so i was um you know a mile and a half uh walk to the first bus stop and then like an hour plus bus ride to like school back and forth like each way every day hmm. and um i couldn't do it anymore because i couldn't afford it and it was just really hard and it was either go back home and like go into a situation in which like i knew i wouldn't thrive as well because like i i, I just knew for myself like certain other pathways weren't for me and i had to stay at ucr or i could make it work and i made it work by uh getting a sleeping bag and getting uh, a bag of canned goods and uh, instant noodles. And I just bummed it around at, uh, what's it called, at different dorms for an entire year. Oh, and I was blessed to have friends that allowed me to do that. Like, it was really hard. Like, sometimes it was just like one meal a day. Sometimes if I got lucky, it was like two cans of soup or something like that and things like that. But like, uh, yeah, it was, it was hard navigating that. And like, it's funny that my trajectory in many ways has always been more about what's come at me in life to inform how I could work and support other folks rather than what do I want out of life? Mm. Um, because I mean, I always find myself gravitating towards uh, working with other people for, for things that serve like the greater community. And, and I think that that's what informed me and really uh, helped my experience throughout college and to ultimately work in community engagement work and higher education work uh, because of that experience. And I, and I wouldn't see myself um, 
in this space without having gone through that, without having, you know, higher education professionals, like allow me to get in touch with not only the campus community, but other community that like made me want to stay in college, you know, made me want to learn more about myself, made me realize that community around us is just as important uh, in higher education as community on it. Um, and so, hmm. yeah, I, I think that what's next is just doing what what speaks to the heart i know it sounds kind of you know yeah. effervescent ethereal <laughs> you know but uh who knows i guess like some concrete goals that i have maybe is to think about getting a phd in ethnic studies or education um but always having uh myself integrated in, into community whether it's like through the different ways that I'm integrated, like in the API community, um, especially right now, um, or just overall grassroots organizations uh, having a foothold in those things too. Um, I just want to say that I'm I'm just open to a lot of it, you know, and uh, yeah. What uh, I know we got to wrap up soon, but we help do Project Decode um, and Project One Ninety Six plus um, at Harvey Mudd College. One was about international students and the other one was about working with uh, working class students mm -hmm. and helping them navigate. So for folks who are doing stuff with student affairs work with international students or student affairs work with first gen students or, or you know, working class students, um, what advice would you give those individuals? advice I would give those individuals is understand your own positionality and in interacting with other people and that inter in that intersectionality that exists within that positionality to understand like what dynamics are at play when you exchange with them when you exchange knowledge um, I think that what was powerful when we worked with one another is that we didn't necessarily always have to provide the guidance but sometimes we put students in touch with people that we worked with with our colleagues that could provide things in a way that weren't packaged uh, mm. by an experience that they weren't familiar with or an experience that didn't speak to their own. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's, that's a lot of what we have to do in general is that we can't see ourselves. There, there has to be some humility in this work because we can't do it all alone, right? Mm -hmm. And that's something that definitely community engagement work has done for me too, is that whether it is, uh, putting on that uh, workshop about how to make, uh, you know, study abroad affordable or careers in um, nonprofit and like how to like make a living off of that without feeling like uh, you, you missed out on a corporate job. Um, yeah. Those different yeah. kinds of things sometimes are best delivered by people that uh, closely resemble other people's experience or as, close as they can with mm. respect to uh, positionality and intersectionality. And sometimes that's us. And sometimes that's the other people that we have to help students get in contact with, our colleagues get in contact with. Um, mm. Because it has to be a decentralized approach, right? Mm. It takes a village. Do you think that it does? Do you think that decentralized approach and kind of a hierarchical approach and very community and person power approach that we took at that institution and a lot of institutions, it's kind of antithetical to the bureaucratic kind of corporate structure of like, just deliver the program to the student. Don't um, don't try don't to deliver it with notes that say burn the place down. <laughs> well, not even. I mean, I don't even know. Right. But I think we were trying to like really give students a voice and really feel like they had ownership of the stuff and 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 trying to step out of the way because we were not students there and 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 there were a lot of protests and issues and lived experiences that students were going through that you and i you know were not that age and we just weren't going through those experiences so we were trying mm -hmm. to put um you know keep everybody safe but also um work with the ideas that students were having do you feel like at institutions you've been at, 
that is like a, a threat to the hierarchical way that higher ed runs. And, and I don't know, I, I mean, does that ever frustrate you? It does, but I think when you work in a space where you are both an employee of an institution and an agent for change, you understand that there is a certain amount of power and privilege that comes with that. Mm -hmm. And like I myself am benefiting from that system too. Mm -hmm. That sometimes keeps people at a deficit, you know, as with a lot of things in, you know, throughout the history of American higher education. Mm -hmm. And so like, I do get frustrated with that, but I benefit from it too. Mm -hmm. You know, I benefit from the hierarchical structure. And what I also have realized is that things may not necessarily need to change on the inside before they change on the outside. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is I think that folks need to start building out these opportunities for people to think about what they want their futures to be beyond what we keep feeding people about higher education. I think that it could be so many more things like we talked about before, like trades people, um, artists, uh, different avenues of like work, uh, different certificate programs that are being built. And when I think about getting frustrated about it, uh, I also have to remind myself that this is just one avenue Mm -hmm. in which people can get educated and become informed uh Mm -hmm. and i have to be open with students sometimes too and just be like you know what i mean like uh who knows like college is for a lot of folks but it doesn't necessarily mean it has to be for you and those have been some hard conversations i've had with other people too you know Mm -hmm. that are college students uh but then some of those folks like thank me for that right They, they don't go that route or they end up going a different route in higher education that they wouldn't have. Uh, and that's because like, I recognize that like, even within that framework, like I'm a part of that, but I also want to let other people know that there are other ways of doing it. Because in doing that, I mean, when I say in, in doing it, I mean like having a different trajectory in life that mm-hmm. isn't almost looked as traditional. And mm-hmm. in doing that, I think it actually puts institutions on their toes mm-hmm. to do better. Right, right, right. They're realizing we're not hitting the mark on certain things right. and they're not coming to us in the same ways. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? They're not seeing us as the only option. And the more that we have these things that we build outside of these spaces, the more that we can understand that like, this is not the only trajectory for mm-hmm. folks and that we should always be on our toes about how we could do better, right? Right, right, right. And maybe that's the focus. Anyways, that's, that's how I've been thinking about like it more it. recently. I like it. I mean, I mean, I think there needs to be a change from the inside and from the outside, right? Definitely. Because you and I and, and our co-workers were trying to push and Some help places people. don't want to change, though, right? Correct. Correct. Well, why would you want to change if you, if you think it's working? But if enough people from the inside and the outside say it's not working, then maybe some of these places would change. But if you had kids, would you, where would you send them to, to school? Me? Right yeah. now? yeah i mean i mean yeah like that's tough i i haven't even thought that far um yeah i haven't even to be real i haven't even thought that far but Mm -hmm. i would along the way help them understand that there are different avenues that you know i wasn't always shown or was told that they were options right and yes Building things from the inside does matter. Um, But I also think that sometimes things have to die. You know, everything has a shelf life. Not everything uh, is meant to last. And as we're seeing right now in the pandemic, there's quite a few institutions that are struggling extremely hard and are on the verge of closing. Right. You know what I mean? Because they 
for whatever reason, maybe had not the best financial practices or they didn't budget their money right, or sometimes it's just bad luck, but other times it's actually like no one wants to support the institution too, because like it's been for some people a place of discomfort. It's been for some people a place of trauma and they don't feel the need to support. So they're not getting that donor money. They're not getting that support in that same way. And so in some ways it's like, you know, I, I do believe that we have to change these places from the inside and maybe that'll take a lot longer, but I think that needs to be a balance, right? You can't have the yin without the yang. Mm. You, you can't let everything uh, live on because not everything is meant to. Damn, that's deep, man. Uh, it's, I mean, that's just, that's just, uh, that's the natural order of life, right? Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah, but uh, yeah, and then some of these institutions that have huge endowments like mm -hmm. Harvard, Yale, and Claremont Colleges, and some of these other places, um, I don't want to say they're immune to uh, the market vicissitudes, but like some, like I like Upright Citizens Brigade, which is like a comedy thing. Mm -hmm. And I went on their website, and they said, "Well, we had to sell off our Sunset building, and we're we're struggling to keep our Franklin Avenue building." And I'm like, dang, that's like a staple of LA. Yeah. Produces all these amazing comedians, improv artists, and provides a huge amount of entertainment for Los Angeles. And I always thought like, oh, they're just balling because now they have two sites where they do their thing. And little did I know, like, they are almost like not going to make it. And, and yeah. it's just interesting to see, um, like, banks are still doing their thing, right? They're fine, Okay. And some of these private schools and hopefully public schools are, are doing okay because they're funded. Um, and then there's these other institutions that we maybe take for granted in society that bring us a lot of joy um, that are crumbling. And yeah, I, I totally see where you're coming from too. You know, yeah. like I, I think that, you know, even within those challenging spaces where we love the institution but struggle with it sometimes like we 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 don't want to see those things go away but uh, it's uh i think it's just sometimes the way that you know the cookie crumbles yeah yeah and, no, it sucks i know and on the other side of things that's where you know i kind of go back to that same thing of like sometimes things have to happen on the outside right like when you're bringing up all these places like the banks, mm -hmm. um, these institutions that don't have the best practices, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. who are we, like, we're still in many ways supporting them. Yeah. You know what I mean? And we're not building coalition outside of them to have substitutes for such. Right. You know, and except, so except it, has, it has to be both, right? Say what? Except, except Trinity Tran is, is trying to make the public bank in um, mm -hmm. Los Angeles, which, yeah, would be yeah, really, yeah, yeah. which would be a healthy alternative to- Exactly, right? Yeah. And you might actually be interested to know that uh, my partner, she's taking these courses about uh, advertising and whatnot. And someone from the Upright Citizens Brigade who like was there as like a comedian, um, they are now giving, uh, what's it called? Comedy classes uh, yeah. for Zoom and teaching people not only like within the framework of like what is specific to comedy as an art form, but like how that can be applied to other things such as advertising, right? Love and it, like, it. now you don't need a brick and mortar. Yeah. Now you can make it that much more accessible to people, right? That may have seen that place in LA and be like, this isn't necessarily for me, right? Or yeah. because I've seen it too. And like, I've never been to a comedy club. Yeah. And uh, wanting to learn about comedy is like something that's like hard for me to, to grapple with. But if I were to like look at a new structure in which people can learn about comedy from Zoom, yeah, you know, it may not work for everybody, but it, it's another avenue that the closing of that place yeah. made someone be like, something else needs to happen outside of that. Mm. Even if the institution crumbles, I loved this part of it and what it did for people. Mm. Therefore, I will carry on this part of what that place stood for in honor of it right that's yeah that's beautiful i like that well i mean even though me you and the team don't work together like we did before i i feel the same way about what we created and the kind of mm -hmm. 
um, camaraderie and institution and, and kind of whatever beautiful community based off of curiosity and education that we tried to create, even though it doesn't exist like that anymore. I'm still learning from the stuff that we were doing and just following our instincts and like, like, this is the moral thing to do. This is the just thing to do. And I, I think when, as you know, as an educator, when you lead from that place, like you can't, you can't really go wrong. I mean, other people might tell you that you're, you're, you're not playing by their rules, but mm -hmm. when you see the impact that you have on other students, staff and faculty, and people are calling you and saying like, keep going. And like, people are writing you emails and letters, yeah. like, keep going. Um, that's, that's, that's beautiful and it's bigger than any paycheck you know what i mean so um exactly we put we put the we put the rat in comrade <laughs> we put the rat in comrade the rad part is in all caps or with with the e doesn't have to be but yeah and the com can stand for community so community radical right so but yeah i i totally agree with that and some of that stuff that happens like juxtaposed mm. the institution <laughs> carries out in like the ways that other people are working wherever they are you know so you're right you're right and you're right and, and usually and you've, touched, and you've touched people through your work that sure. doesn't necessarily have to happen where you're at but it informs what they do so. right exactly and that's the and that's the weird thing about a beautiful thing about teaching like you never know weird and beautiful weird and beautiful that's my yep. motto. That's sometimes my motto. things on national geographic are weird and beautiful <laughs> you never know what you instilled in someone or like what fruits are going to grow later on. And, and uh, you know, some students keep reaching out to me that I, the years have unfortunately had me forget uh, our interactions, but then they all come back. Cause it's like, Oh, okay. Yeah. I remember this is, wow. We did create something beautiful together. So, man, I just wanted to thank you for, for being part of that um, growth and change uh, at that institution and, and, I'm really proud of you, what you're doing uh, in your career now. And I, and I just, I just want the best for you going forward. So that's why I'm always like, you know, mama birding you and like calling you and be like, Hey, you doing, <laughs> like, you doing good. You know, cause I, I yeah, you know, no, I know I, it's been a hard year, man. Yes, I know it's yes. been a hard year, like on all of us and for many reasons. And it's like, it's made me have to do not only this physical isolation in many ways, but this social isolation to like really get down to a lot of things that are like ways in which like I'm hurting, but also ways in which, you know, I could be contributing to the hurt of others and things that I need yeah. to do better because like there are a lot of things that I could do better as an advocate, you know, you know, for my black colleagues and for my indigenous colleagues, you know, mm. I've been fighting for so long in many ways in higher education or like, understanding you know my positionality and intersectionality and all of it hmm. um and a lot of those fruits that you talked about that i still carry over now and mentioned about colleagues and higher education professionals i've been in contact with like you are definitely one of those people like hmm. for sure that have helped me in, in an enormous way so hmm. i mean like you, you talk about fruits i'm partial to mango you're a mango, that mango, you know, so. If you didn't wear the batik shirt, we would never would have had that first conversation. At I know, before. isn't that right. crazy? Yeah, it's crazy. It's, it's nuts, actually, how that works. Dude, what's uh, that? What is that? <laughs> cool shirt. That's oh, how Zach and I met. That's how we met. Touched so, my yeah. shirt. <laughs> Consensually. Because, I don't he, know. because he knew, consensually. Because he knew he'd been to Singapore, he knows, he knows the traditional garb. That's right. That's right. That's right. Um, all right. We got to let folks go. Uh, so thank you for coming on, Jonathan. This is amazing. Um, uh, my T-shirt is in the mail. I, I, I got one of those as well. Um, nice, nice, nice. <laughs> Joe Brooks, thank you so much for letting us utilize this space. Communityworksinstitute.org. Please check them out for professional development opportunities for K through 20 educators. Um, and maybe Jonathan will even be doing a workshop at one of the community works institutes. Um, and check back with us for next Friday when Joe Brooks does um, uh, the uh, spotlight series and I do the Sundays. And this has been a really tough um, year and a half 
for a lot of folks. I had I know some folks personally that literally did not make it through and are now no longer with us. Um, and there's other people who uh, lost their apartments, their houses, their livelihood, family members. So please take care of yourself as much as you can out there. Um, people have gone into like really bad depressions and some folks have like, you know, uh, done harm to themselves. So it's been really, really difficult for a lot of people. I want to acknowledge that um, and just like love on yourself and others because nothing's promised. Who knows what's going to happen tomorrow and like more stuff is going up, right? 1600 new cases. So just like, I think if anything from this conversation, Jonathan, you reminded me of like, we make beauty in life sporadically and we just have to like hold on to that. And uh, I, I just wanted to thank you for, for creating that educational beauty with me. And, and let's keep, uh, let's just find ways to work together more. And I, I really love you, man. And I appreciate everything that you're doing for the community. Same, man. Thank you for everything that you do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Peace, everybody.